Prisoners around the country are often released before they complete their prison sentences, but they must meet the criteria for parole. In some cases, the parole boards have released criminals who have committed shocking crimes and should not have been eligible. Whose interests are parole boards meant to serve? Masa Kakana investigates. In 2019, South Africa saw widespread protests against gender-based violence. Young and old took to the streets saying, enough is enough. President Ramaphosa addressed thousands of protesters gathered outside parliament, promising stricter punishment. But convicted women and child rapists continue to be released on parole. Just last month, we saw the release of another child rapist, perhaps South Africa's most famous pedophile, Bob Hewitt. Now, it took over 30 years for the victims to finally get justice and put him behind bars. It took the St. Albans Parole Board just a few hours to release him and send him home. In the men's double, South Africa's represented by Bob Hewitt and Drew McMillan. And the South Africa... Grand Slam champion Bob Hewitt was a household name in South African tennis who coached young players. But in 2015, he was convicted of raping two former students. Suelen Sheehan was 12 years old at the time, and Twiggy Tolkien was just 13. He was also convicted of indecently assaulting another teenager whose identity is protected by the court. Judge Bert Bam took Hewitt's age into account and sentenced the 75-year-old to an effective six years in jail. The convicted paedophile appealed his sentence, but this was dismissed by both the Supreme Court of Appeal and the Constitutional Court. We had gotten justice. What nobody told us was that six years would not be six years. Nobody told us it would effectively be three years. Sue Ellen has since changed her name to Olivia Jasriel. She and the other two victims were shocked to discover that the St. Albans Parole Board had convened without their knowledge and granted Hewitt parole in August last year. I felt very minimised. I felt, what did we do this for? Just right there, my constitutional rights were just completely disregarded. Prisoners are entitled to be considered for parole once they've served half their sentence, except in the case of a life sentence. But victims are equally entitled to object in person or in writing. However, there's a gaping flaw in this process. Prison authorities are supposed to notify victims when offenders are going to a parole hearing to give them the opportunity to object. But that can only happen if they know who you are. They don't come looking for you. The onus is on you, the victim, to find out where the offender is being held and then give the prison your contact details. Despite having the victim's details, correctional services failed to notify them of Hewitt's hearing. In a response to Carte Blanche, the department says they and the parole board took into account Olivia's earlier representations when Hewitt applied to convert his sentence to correctional supervision. But Justice Minister Ronald Lamola intervened and Hewitt's parole was later cancelled. Advocate Johan Engelbrecht is Hewitt's legal representative. How did you and Bob Hewitt feel when the Parole Review Board cancelled his parole? He was disappointed. Anybody would be disappointed. You are released on parole and a person comes from outside uh, who's only the minister and cancels your parole release. Why do you and the Hewitts feel he has the right to freedom? Well, anybody has the right to freedom. But he was convicted of rape. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. But in my opinion, he was not guilty and he should not have been sentenced. Judge Siraj Desai is the chairman of the National Council of Correctional Services and heads up the Parole Review Board. They can review the decisions made by individual parole boards around the country. He reviewed the Hewitt matter. All we said was, you cannot release this offender without victim-offender dialogue taking place. I set aside the decision of the parole board and sent it back to them to reconsider the matter together with inputs from the victims. Tanya Kuhn represents two of Hewitt's victims and noted another crucial recommendation. That the department must pursue individual psychotherapy for the offender 
so that he could gain insight into his offences. Johan Engelbrecht yesterday told us that Hewitt attended two therapy sessions. For any sex offender, is two sessions enough? I cannot possibly think that two sessions could be enough, but that's my layperson's opinion. Luc Lamprecht represents women and men against child abuse and has vast experience in helping victims to navigate the criminal justice system. As a child rights, child protection community, we believe that our voices should also be heard in parole hearings because parole makes provision that the community's needs and wishes are taken into consideration when parole is granted and particularly because we are specialists in that field. He's been involved in this case from the beginning and along with Tanya, accompanied Olivia to the parole board hearing in March this year. But the parole board would not allow him in to address the hearing. Most of us have never been to a parole board hearing and because the proceedings are confidential, we're unable to film one. But they are held in the prison, in a boardroom, where the victim has to sit at the very same table as their perpetrator. They put us in the room directly opposite each other. It just, just takes you straight back to when I was 12. Correctional Services presented the findings of Hewitt's Case Management Committee. And there was a document probably of about between three and 400 pages of reports of all the psychometric testing, psychological testing, etc., that he's done. So every single report that they read came back that he is not rehabilitated. He lives in denial, he shows no remorse, and he takes no accountability for what he has done to us. At the end of the day, it would have been nice to have had, I'm sorry for what I did to you. He said he was not guilty, so he's not going to ask for forgiveness. So how's he been rehabilitated if he feels he's done nothing wrong? He didn't do anything wrong, and he went through every class that was presented to him in prison, and the prison found him to be a suitable candidate because he will not commit another crime again. But according to international paedophile expert, Dr. James Cantor, a paedophile cannot be reformed. We can't rehabilitate a pedophile in the sense that we, uh, there's no known way to convert a pedophile into a non-pedophile. There's a cross wiring in the paedophiles. They are correctly perceiving a child to be a child, but it seems to be uh, uh, evoking the sexual and the flirtatious responses rather than the parental and avuncular responses. Is pedophilia a sexual preference? Yes, it is. It's a basic, innate, neurological, you know, inborn sexual attraction pattern, and it cannot change. Dr. Cantor has studied the brains of over 250 pedophiles through MRI scans. Pedophilia, the sexual attraction pattern to children, is a brain phenomenon. These people's uh, brain structures are significantly different from people who are not pedophilic. Whatever chain of events it is that led to these brain differences, the first links of that chain go back to birth. Despite objections from all three victims, Hewitt was released on parole on the 24th of April. Do you believe the parole board took your client's objections seriously? Definitely no comments. When I went into that hearing, a decision had already been made. They've insulted my intelligence, they've insulted my integrity. And they wasted my time and my money. Whatever the offence, the man reaches the age of 80, we're not in a position to second guess the court that sentenced him to six years in prison. There's no indications that he would re-offend at the age of 80. Then one is just being vindictive in refusing the law. And the department told Carte Blanche that on parole, Hewitt will still have to comply with conditions and will be subject to supervision. But when parole boards get it wrong, the consequences can be fatal. It seems parole boards around the country have allowed killers and paedophiles to slip through the bars and release them back into the community. The results? Often tragic. In February this year, a convicted murderer who was out on parole allegedly killed his four children in Limbobo. He'd previously been jailed for murdering his neighbor's child, but was released on parole. Also in February, eight-year-old Reagan Hatzer was raped and murdered in Tilbach, allegedly by a family member. The community protested outside the bail hearing of the suspect, who was previously convicted of raping a five-year-old boy, but was released on parole. There is a high level of recidivism in this country. Those crimes are of particular serious nature, and that requires a high degree 
of careful consideration before it could possibly be released. People who've committed very serious offences uh, or have committed multiple rapes and murders, that sort of offender one could never release. The idea that men who are on parole, rape and kill are found to be of the travesties of justice we have in the world, of the greatest. I mean, it, it just talks to the entire system being completely broken in terms of the protection and safety of, of children.